Hello and greetings to our viewers from Hello and greetings to our viewers from around the world. I'm Joanne Lasoski, author and journalism educator from the US. Of course, today we are focusing on the unfortunate war that has been going on for three days in the Nakaro Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. And with me are several members of the Azerbaijan diaspora, Mr. Arif Shakmarli, former Azerbaijani ambassador to the Council of Europe and the EU, and Dr. Leila Aliva, Russian and East European Studies Affiliate, Oxford School of Global and Area Studies at the University of Oxford in the UK. Hello and thank you for being here to discuss this very serious and important issue in Azerbaijan today. So let's go directly to it. With all of the news today, this story really hits home for all of you. The internet is unreliable in Azerbaijan, so in order to get news, we are relying on the diaspora mostly to give us information. How would you characterize this conflict at this time, Arif? Uh, thank you, Joanna, uh, for uh, you know for for organizing this uh, very important discussion, a uh, very key discussion we uh, nevertheless internet in in azerbaijan is is limited almost not existent but we see huge uh, attention to uh, to this conflict this time uh, different media sources all international media covers the story and i cannot say that it is a conflict this is a full scale war uh, and probably uh, since the ceasefire uh, we see uh, the, for the first time, such a huge extent of military operations with the use of uh, modern type of weapons, of modern drone systems, aviation, uh, heavy artillery, uh, engineering equipments, and a huge uh, number of uh, troops from both sides. Uh, we see um, uh, the emergency declared in both uh, countries general mobilization or part uh, partial mobilization is declared it, we have never seen such things in the past uh, even during the four days uh, war in april 2016 uh, at that time we also have seen lots of uh, uh, use of modern weaponry uh, and um, uh, huge losses human losses but we haven't seen such an extent and um, and we, if that time Azerbaijani army uh, launched a uh, you know counter uh, offensive in one direction, now we see uh, fighting is going on along alongside uh, all uh, engagement line. Uh, so this is uh, unusual, uh, according to Azerbaijani Minister of Defense, uh, Azerbaijani army advances its uh, attack on uh, on Fizuli district of uh, Karabakh uh, uh, no, Fizuli region occupied Fizuli region of Azerbaijan and going further to Jibrail uh, we also see uh, uh, quite um, uh, successful operation in Agdara Azerbaijani army according to uh, official Azerbaijani sources have taken control over very important uh, move of dark uh, chain, you know, mountain uh, chains. Uh, we see, um, you know, this is, a, as I said, the war, but we can see uh, different frames. If we look narrow, we see this is like war between uh, Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia. Even probably, if we take even smaller, it is a uh, uh, operation of Azerbaijan for liberation of its occupied uh, territories around Nagorno-Karabakh. With, if we see wider, it is real war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. We look a little bit wider. We see also Turkey and Russia appearing on the scene. Uh, if we extend a little bit further, we see Iran 
uh, the Western interests, um, and we can extend it further, further, and we will see many, many players uh, because our region is important. Uh, there are uh, ge geopolitical interests, transport interests. Uh, uh, issue of Iran is very important. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, communication lines, uh, including fiber, fiber uh, communication lines, which passes through the Caucasus. Uh, uh, importance of Caspian Sea and proximity uh, to the Middle East. Well, we see, uh, for example, during the operations in Syria, uh, Russian uh, Navy used Caspian uh, Sea to, to attack uh, targets in, in Syria so that uh, it's accessible, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Caspian Sea. You can carry out operations in different directions. So this is real war uh, with many players with uh, uh, crossing interests, uh, with diversing interests, and uh, we uh, probably, the more time the war will go, the more players will appear. For now, we see mostly uh, Turkey in one side, uh, Russia on another side. Uh, we, we see that the European uh, players try to mediate a uh, proposing uh, and asking the sides to stop uh, the fighting and start uh, peaceful negotiations. Uh, but probably these calls remain uh, un unnoticed uh, on both sides. And I don't believe that at this stage any side is ready to really start talking because uh, nothing is, uh, is clear. Uh, Azerbaijan has been asking uh, Armenia to liberate at least occupied territories. It's not about uh, it's not about Karabakh even. It is about firstly other seven occupied territories around Nagorno-Karabakh. If uh, there have been ups and downs in negotiation, uh, but unfortunately uh, uh, after the Velvet Revolution in Armenia, uh, we were expecting a uh, uh, democratic campaign as everyone was, was expecting that New administration, democratically elected uh, prime minister, will make some steps in order to start uh, resolving this conflict, at least uh, liberating some territories. But nothing happened. We, we haven't seen readiness uh, to talk even about two, three regions. Not We, we don't even uh, start speaking about five and seven. Even when Russia was saying that we have agreed that uh, we're, not, we're now talking about five regions around Karabakh. Armenia was immediately making statement that, no, we cannot talk. There is not anything about five regions, about even one region. And it was causing disappointment in Baku. Uh, and I think that this is the, uh, the result of, of, of all this. Unfortunately, we have also seen co-chairs have distanced themselves from the process for quite a long time. Uh, probably uh, US uh, is uh, completely out of the scene uh, for, for quite a long time. Uh, the US where... is dealing with many other things at this time. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, many other issues. Absolutely. But, but we have seen US very serious engagement during uh, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, uh, Kiev's talks. Uh, there well, they was, were part of the Minsk um, yes, Foundation. There was a global, global plan uh, uh, pushed by uh, Under Secretary of uh, State, uh, Stop Talbot. Okay. Yeah, let's let's move on and talk about, we'll talk about negotiations as we go forward. But I really would like to hear what, thank you very much, Arif. I would really like to hear what Layla has to say. I know she's been a researcher of this area for many years and has some really keen insights as to how she would characterize conflict at this time. Uh, well, uh, I, I think the um, peculiarity of this conflict is the involvement of at least two, well, two external actors, 
in the secessionist movement in uh, Azerbaijan. And this is Armenia and Russia. As compared to the other states um, like Moldova or uh, Georgia or Ukraine, there is one actor, external actor, which involves in the interface and helps and aids the secession movement. And usually the behavior of the external actors in developments in the country for the domestic stability are very important. And uh, if the external actor takes the position of pacifying, non-stirring the conflict, uh, then, uh, you know, the, uh, it's much easier to find the solution to the conflict within the country. In our case, it's much more complex than in the others, exactly because there are uh, at least two actors who are interfering. Um, in general, uh, um, the uh, solution of, uh, or let's say development of this conflict being dependent on Russia was evident or obvious from the very early stages of this conflict. And that's why LGB uh, put a major objective to get independence, full independence from Russia, including in the security area. Uh, it's still actual today. It hasn't changed because at certain point in the 90s, our leaders, Georgian leader, uh, Azerbaijani leader, consistent, they were trying to basically get rid of Russian influence to develop policy that Russia to decrease Russia's influence. But unfortunately, they couldn't get the counterbalance, security counterbalance in the region. So they were left vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And as a result, they developed their individual strategies uh, regarding Russia. So they were left just on their own to deal with Russia in security area. We missed a very important moment and now the situation has changed because we have a new actor coming to the stage and that's Turkey, who many uh, perceive as an actor who might challenge the Russia's domination in the security in the region. And that's why and the situation in Baku is quite different. Because if you look at the uh, reports from the front line, you know, there are daily uh, reports of the quite a lot of uh, victims and there are young victims, but the spirit is quite high. And I think it's partly because of the Turkish uh, support and Turkish uh, sort of involvement. And, uh, you know, I, probably the uh, stage when people are just simply uh, the patience is over because for 27 years the uh, troops were on the territory, the resolutions were not implemented, there were no sanctions against the violator of the uh, you know international borders, there were not any consequences for the country which violates the international law. So when in the what I call normative uncertainty or lack of a sort of normative um, uh, institution and implementer of uh, such norms, of course, the country takes, um, you know, it uh, on itself and tries to uh, change the balance. And with all that said, I would say that war is, of course, the worst way to resolve the, the conflict. It's always the last resort. My question to both of you now is why did this heat up at this time? As, as we've mentioned, it's been going on, this, this conflict or what Arif has said now, this war, but the conflict itself has been going on for 27 years. We have had political tourists who have traveled around the area and talked about negotiations, but negotiations have never really moved anywhere. Why did this heat up at this time? Um, I, I would continue. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, firstly, uh, we have seen uh, the void that existed for a long time. We have seen only Russian diplomacy being active 
uh, in Karabakh. Uh, almost uh, co-chairs role was just having nice uh, uh, lunches and dinners in uh, different European capitals, but we haven't seen any any progress. Uh, we have seen more like uh, lover of diplomacy and Russian diplomacy, uh, like Kazan talks and uh, some agreements, but we never knew what was really happening because uh, all the talks were held in, in high uh, secrecy. Um, uh, they, as I said, uh, after two, uh, 2001, 2003, uh, we have seen less US involvement, uh, and particularly two last administrations, both Barack Obama and, uh, and uh, now uh, Trump, Donald Trump administration, have shown almost no uh, interest in the conflict. And uh, Turkey, uh, you know, joined, you know, just, just have taken its place in the void. Uh, uh, and generally we see Turkey is very active, not only in the Caucasus. We have seen Turkish role uh, being increased in Syria, in North Africa. Uh, we see, for example, Turkey is now having the uh, biggest military base in Africa, in Somalia. Uh, uh, the biggest uh, military base is not a... Uh, is not US based or, or Russian based, but Turkish based in Somalia. Uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, we see also increasing alliance between Azerbaijan and Turkey in different areas in energy, in political, in e economic fields. Um, also, probably COVID 19 added uh, some um, attention to the general, uh, you know, tension in everywhere. Uh, probably even, uh, you know, uh, we, we see even a high, more, more demonstrations around the world so that people need something, you know, just lots of energy uh, has been generated in not only in ordinary people, but also in politicians. Uh, so uh, interesting. That is so interesting. Ari. That is yeah. such a good point. But of course, uh, Turkey uh, Turkey has also been very active in the Mediterranean. Uh, recently, uh, they started exploring the gas fields uh, in um, in Mediterranean Sea. That caused additional tension uh, between Turkey, Greece, and France. France even threatened and brought its military uh, warships uh, close to Turkish ones, and um, French, both French and Greece, Greek. Uh, planes uh, were overflying uh, Turkey, this field and, and also Turkish, uh, uh, you know, exploration ships. So uh, tension is everywhere. Um, also, we see uh, lots of tension around Russia. Uh, firstly, uh, in Belarus, there is a, a Lukashenko issue that he tries to, to stay in power, uh, Navalny issue. Is, is very important because uh, there is more pressure on Russia to start investigation on uh, on, on this uh, uh, poisoning of Navalny. Uh, internal situation in Russia in Khabarovsk and other regions, we have seen uh, more demonstrations than in the past. Uh, probably um, uh, both Russia and Turkey, for, for me, uh, needed some diversion of attention from lots of other issues and problems. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, probably uh, South Caucasus is the area where they can both strengthen their geopolitical positions, uh, play more, uh, you know, strong hand in other places like in Mediterranean. Uh, but you know, being strong in the Caucasus, but also try to be to say that now we are player here, but we are player also in the Mediterranean, in Syria. In, in Libya and many other places. So that um, we see in the past, probably Russia would be more actively uh, expressing its uh, uh, support to its allied Armenia. Now we see uh, more or less like very careful uh, statements, but not uh, clear uh, support state statements for Armenia. Uh, it uh, gives me a uh, belief that, uh, it, it uh, makes me to believe that there is some kind of uh, engagement between uh, Russia and Turkey. 
they, secret they, engagement? Are you talking about something secret that's going on that we don't I hear don't about? Know how secret is? But we have seen in the past, for example, in Syria, the the Russian and uh, Turkish proxies have been fighting with each other, but finally. Uh, there is some kind of communication. They, they manage to uh, not to go to war, but like very tiny line where they can, they agree on the last moment and they can, you know, uh, uh, and, and the same in Libya. We see uh, Russia supports Haftar troops, Turkey supports government of national unity. But in the meantime, uh, there are some clashes, uh, including between Turkish uh, pro-Turkish forces and uh, pro-Russian forces. But finally, uh, they managed to probably, they, they even enjoy such kind of, uh, uh, you know, confrontation and geopolitical chess. This is very serious geopolitical chess. This is about new geopolitical roles for Russia, uh, for Turkey, in the Balkans, in, in the Middle East, in the Caucasus, and further to the Central Asia. I believe that this is wider geopolitical. We see only very small part of geopolitics, but when we try to open a little bit wider the vision, we see that geopolitical goes further. Iran is very important. Uh, uh, and, you know, I can, I can talk for uh, hours, but I would stop here. Thank you, Arif. That is so insightful that it's a, a game of political chess that's going on right now. And why, while Turkey and Russia didn't start the conflict or the war, they are certainly moving the pawns around the chess game, right? They are moving the parts around the chess game. And Leila, if you could answer, uh, speak a little bit to that question about why now? Why did this 27-year conflict suddenly heat up to a war. Well, I guess it wasn't suddenly. It's just been escalating to that fact that now both countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, are both declaring war. Why now? Uh, well, I will speak about the general context. And the general context, as you correctly mentioned, it was um, evolving and lead to this point, first of all, is failure of negotiations, which everyone was seeing, increasingly seeing as just a uh, very slow going um, uh, framework for rather imitation of any progress. Uh, then uh, we uh, observed recently with arrival, I, I, especially after the revolution, a series of rather political symbolic provocations. Uh, you know, the Pashinyan was going to Karabakh, was dancing there, or the most recent uh, news that it was already, of course, prepared, but recently it was especially clearly stated that uh, the parliament will be uh, stationed in um, um, Azerbaijani historical old city, which was ethnically cleansed. Um, and uh, these are, of course, uh, were perceived as quite um, um, uh, clear provocations. Um, uh, definitely Turkey's role, um, new role, as uh, Arif Bay correctly noticed. Uh, Turkey uh, became more independent, um, unlike in the previous decades when it was very much tied by its membership in NATO, its negotiations with the EU, and now when it started to develop its relatively independent policies in the Middle East, it moves closer to the, um, let's say, area of interest or sphere of uh, influence of Russia, uh, which is quite dangerous, I would say. Um, but uh, so that's why I kind of of um, view the situation a bit uh, more risky than when they were clashing in Syria or somewhere else. Um, and I would add one more component or two more components. One of them is declining of the significance of oil and gas, uh, because before um, uh, this uh, no peace, no war stability, was uh, preserved also by the vested interests 
of the West in the um, continuing stability. So the flow of oil and gas uh, oil, first of all, was uninterrupted. But because many oil companies are now withdrawing, there is a decline of the oil production, the gas is still there, but it's not as important as before. So um, I think partly that also plays a role. And definitely COVID uh, and economic and other failures of the governance in both countries in Armenia and Azerbaijan contribute to that. Because if you look for, um, in Armenia, the statistics of COVID infections is highest in the region. In Azerbaijan, we have serious economic social problems, which are caused both by the uh, decline of the oil production and oil income and COVID consequences. So, um, and of course, the similar uh, domestic considerations are um, driving both Russia and Turkey. So we should not exclude the domestic uh, considerations and motivation of all four actors. So um, I am very curious, something, thank you very much, um, uh, Leila, that, that's very insightful to sort of bring in the whole idea of it's it's of four different countries that are playing in this. And, and the idea that the lowering of the value of oil has really caused a lot of disruption in the region, just sort of something that that liquid gold that people thought would be around forever and be valuable forever is losing its value. And that along with COVID has caused this sort of powder cake of people and their emotions and their reactions to things has really changed. What I am very curious about, something that I've read here in the US has to do with some disinformation that we, we are hearing about this uh, war in Karabakh. And it has to do with um, this war being characterized as a religious war. And to me, after spending time in Azerbaijan, I don't, I can't imagine that this is a religious war. So I question that. But now from both of you, can, can you respond to this idea of what some in the U.S. are characterizing this as a religious war. Can you speak to that? Uh, uh, Joanna, firstly, before uh, answering uh, this question, I would like to add to what uh, Leila uh, said. Uh, probably uh, this should have been a separate question about energy uh, and oil price uh, drop. Uh, while oil price dropped, importance of gas is not uh, diminished. Uh, on the contrary, we see more competition for uh, for gas supplies to, to European markets. So now we see United States is also uh, wants to, to sell its uh, uh, li liquid gas uh, to Europe. Uh, we see Russia. Uh, this North Stream uh, is under danger uh, because of this poisoning of Navalny. Uh, so uh, when there is new tension in the Caucasus, uh, so supplies of gas from from Caucasus and uh, further in the future from the uh, Central Asia is endangered, the chances for Russia still to push for uh, its North Stream is very important. Now, uh, um, European Parliament called uh, Germany and other states to um, uh, you know, to block, uh, you know, uh, or fin finalization of this Nord Stream and to put sanctions on the Nord Stream. Uh, why Russia is more interested? Because when there another very important supply for Europe, ca Caucasian energy is uh, uh, under threat. There is new conflict and uncertainty. Uh, Russia can push more. Uh, with its uh, Nord Stream project, which is for Russia uh, maybe the issue of life and death, because Russian economy is dependent on uh, on Nord Stream, because now Ukrainian uh, direction is uh, almost not existent. 
Belarus uh, in Belarus situation is uh, uh, you know how is it so uh, for for Russia North Stream is extremely extremely important and any conflict in other part uh, particularly in the Caucasus uh, you know this TANAP TAP pipelines Trans uh, Anatolian gas pipeline, Trans Adriatic pipe, uh, pipeline. All these uh, pipelines are now uh, under um, threat because uh, you know that Armenian forces are just a few uh, dozens of kilometers, you know, uh, during the July fighting in Tawuz direction. Uh, these uh, main communications, like, like gas and oil communication, were passing through there. So, uh, this is another reason why Russia might be interested in in this. Uh, coming to uh, to religious, of course, this is this has nothing to do with the religious war. We see uh, Armenia being supported by Iran, Shia Iran, while uh, Azerbaijan, Shia as uh, mostly Shia Azerbaijan has very tense relations with uh, with uh, with Shia Iran. Um, uh, also, Shia Iran suspects uh, uh, Shia Azerbaijan having close cooperation with Jewish Israel. So uh, it has nothing to do with the religious war. It has nothing to do with uh, with uh, uh, other issues. It is uh, Azerbaijan really carries out uh, counter terrorist operation. Uh, Leila also mentioned very important issue. Uh, new Armenian uh, um, leadership, Pashinyan have made many, many provocative steps. Uh, or he, so even Armenian Security Council meetings have been held in in Karabakh. Uh, they held military parade in Kar Karabakh. Lots of things which irritated all the time. Not only uh, Azerbaijani uh, political leadership, but ordinary people. And we, we were accusing myself, uh, I have been very sharply criticizing Ali for doing nothing uh, uh, against these provocations. So um, lots of blames falls on, on new uh, post-Velvet uh, Armenian leadership. Uh, they have t lost momentum. They should have started immediately talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, immediately Engage, uh, start engagement with the peace talks, uh, and they, they, this is uh, their big mistake. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is so insightful, and and you're giving me so much more information about the the whole start of this conflict and it escalating into a war. That um, there are so it, it's so very complex, and you are really clearing this up for me. Adiv, thank you very much. Leila, do you have any comments about um, this being characterized as a religious conflict or a religious war? Yeah, I think it was uh, done for the PR purposes. Um, I think it's done mainly on the from the Armenian side uh, in the uh, hopes that it will attract more conscious and subconscious identification with the Armenian party in the West. I remember I gave a talk on Karabakh, uh, the Harriman Institute in 1992. Um, and uh, at the same time, or just a day before, there was one Armenian um, scholar uh, who gave a talk. And we had absolutely polar interpretations of the conflict because she based all her uh, story on the Islamic and Christian um, confrontation, uh, while I was basing it on totally different. <laughs> um, and uh, I think, uh, at least I remember the reaction from the students who invited me after that for dinner. They were absolutely fascinated and they said that they liked this talk very much. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think it was, it's been there for a while, mainly because also, uh, unfortunately, this conflict is based on the parad paradigm, which is um, 200 years old. And um, that the origin, origins of this paradigm and conflict are coming 
from the uh, attempt of Russia as empire to, with the uh, settling Armenians and Caucasus to weaken the Islamic periphery with the help of the church. So um, you might, uh, you know, um, refer to that, but then it just discloses that it's extremely outdated conflict, even, even this is about paradigm of the conflict. Well, we've all mentioned that. that thank you very much, Leila. That's giving me more information all the time. I, I love the idea of listening to you as the Azerbaijani scholar and the Armenian scholar sort of coming from two different directions on what, what begins this conflict and what continues this conflict or war now. Um, peace negotiations, we've all mentioned that peace negotiations have been ongoing for 27 years. So with your great insights, the two of you, can you, can you give me an idea, someone here sitting in the United States hoping to see conflict mitigated around the world, um, what can be done to stop this war? Um. I personally believe that um, U.S. has to, uh, you know, take the lead in this because we, we see Europe is very weakened now. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, internal problems within the European Union. Uh, uh, particularly after Brexit, we see that EU is not, yeah, it has not yet uh, defined its uh, direction. We see. Uh, contradictions within the EU. There are like different EUs, like uh, like uh, Hungary, Poland, and some other EU member states are uh, are not agreeing with with many uh, key EU policies. So um, lack of US involvement is, as I said, is one of the reasons why uh, we see other actors being more more important. Uh, uh, I believe that. Uh, if U.S. will take this leadership and talk both with Russia and Turkey, it would be very important. Um, uh, Minsk Group probably it is outdated, uh, outdated uh, structure or setting. Uh, Minsk Group is not working, and uh, and probably it needs uh, uh, new blood. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that it, uh, the new blood would come all the with the size. Probably they expired its um, its uh, credibility, uh, probably on both sides, because we haven't seen uh, any progress. Uh, uh, we uh, and uh, uh, Turkey, I, I am sure that Turkey will insist on bigger role from now on in the uh, on any future a deal in Karabakh, even if Armenia doesn't agree, uh, they will have to accept the uh, more important role of Turkey, as we had to accept the role of Russia uh, in the beginning of the conflict. Uh, we were not happy about Russian role, we're not happy about some other countries' role, but we had to accept, and, uh, and probably Armenia will have to accept the new role of Turkey in the region. Uh, many uh, are terrified by this, uh, not only Armenia, but I think that Iran is very, uh, very uh, worried about uh, uh, more role of Turkey uh, in the region. Uh, but uh, as I said, I believe that uh, U.S. Uh, probably after uh, it wouldn't happen uh, uh, before elections. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but the war is going on, and I don't think that it will be three, four, five days war. Probably uh, one, two, three months war, even longer. Uh, I, I yeah, I, I don't see anything uh, that can stop the war at this stage. Um, um, I I don't think that uh, any side will would listen. For example, Azerbaijan wouldn't listen unless Armenia agrees to start talks on liberation of our territories. Uh, and, and, and this time, uh, and we have all the rights. I have seen today uh, the um, German um, Bundestag uh, deputy saying that international law is on the side of Azerbaijan. 
It is Azerbaijani international territories, internationally recognized territories. Azerbaijan carries all, uh, out its uh, operation in on its territory, uh, and uh, it's not even in in proper autonomous region of Nagorno-Karabakh, even if you take uh, uh, before the Soviet Union, it was autonomous region. Now Azerbaijan tries to liberate six of its occupied territories, and uh, we have all the rights of, uh, according to international law to continue this. Uh, uh, as I understand, Azerbaijan tries to uh, take all the necessary measures so that uh, uh, to reduce collateral damage to the civilians. Uh, there are warnings for the civilians to leave the areas. Uh, there are corridors which are given for civilians. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't see that this someone can take the magic, uh, you know, and say that stop now and everybody stops. Nobody is going, going to, to listen. And even those who would pretend to listen will say from the other side that not that go on. <laughs> so, so thank you, Arif. But I have a question. If you if you think that the US should get involved, under what strategy? Sanctions? No, I don't think that sanctions would work. Okay. Uh, sanctions uh, uh, unfortunately sanctions are not uh, important element and we have seen this uh, uh, on the sanction on Russia. On the longer term, if you think of like long term sanctions, like three or five years pushing, pushing all the time, uh, anyway, economy uh, everywhere is uh, is in bad shape. Right. Uh, probably sanctions uh, uh, against, uh, for example, Azerbaijan would also mean sanctions, sanctioning uh, the West because uh, these pipelines are important for the West also to counterbalance the Russian supplies. So uh, sanctions, I don't think that the sanctions, but uh, uh, US has lots of uh, le um, uh, leverages and uh, uh, lines of communication uh, with both Russia and Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a liar of, of the United States at NATO in other levels. Uh, uh, silent dip diplomacy is very important. I don't think that now the statements would be helpful. Uh, calls for uh, for talks uh, reminds me like calls uh, previous calls from the European institutions to liberate political prisoners uh, that have been ignored by Aliyev, by Lukashenko, by others for many years. Probably silent. Uh, we have to give the uh, the time for silent diplomacy, and US has a uh, uh, quite. Um, uh, good experience of um, uh, talking silently with the sides and pu and um, agree and, and pushing the sides to come to the terms which would uh, which would be reasonable for all the sides. Which means that could, if it's silent diplomacy, uh, if it could be happening now and we just don't know about it, right? Yeah, I, I believe that there is something going on. Uh, 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 of course, U.S. was aware that some uh, the bigger war would start. Uh, that's why just day before uh, the full uh, full scale was started, U.S. embassies both in Baku and Yerevan wanted citizens to not to move outside of the capitals. So that, uh, of course, uh, uh, U.S. had intelligence information of high uh, possibility of full scale war. And uh, probably uh, silent diplomacy is going on, uh, but I think that uh, after whatever happens, uh, we will have new configuration, new players, uh, new setting, and Armenia will have to start really not just talking, but really start liberating uh, occupied Azerbaijani territories. Or at least negotiating. Thank you, Arif. Uh, Leila, do you have any ideas on any strategies um, that we could be sharing with the rest of the world on how to mitigate this war? Um, it's tough because, um, as I said, the Western uh, involvement, uh, which everyone perceives as normative power, is very weak in the region. So Russia feels itself unlimited. Um, and uh, establish its own rules of the games. 
and manipulates the country's um, rules, um, uh, consolidates its influence in the region. As I said, there might be, and I agree with Arif Bey, that um, Turkey's interest might uh, bring some element of um, uh, new configuration. But one should not forget that policies of uh, Turkey are also quite driven by the domestic interests and uh, they might not be as reliable as we might think. So um, Turkey might have uh, its own interest, as I said, and um, it might also establish the limits on how far Turkey can go in support of Azerbaijan. So in the end, the solution is um, uh, between the two countries. I would say that societies should uh, take the lead, maybe, because I remember when the, the uh, revolution in um, Armenia took place and I asked some young people in Armenia, did they like um, the new leader and how he basically yes, but the nationalist rhetoric is not very attractive. The same thing is happening in Azerbaijan. You have, first of all, the group of people who are against the war, the younger people who are against the war. There are younger people who are who transcend the borders, who see themselves as part of the more global community. And if the foreign, uh, so for foreign powers, there are two ways to resolve the issue. Either, as Arif Bey said, one <laughs> country like the US, powerful country, comes, overtakes um, the uh, Russia's influence there and sort of uh, um, may accelerate the solution of the conflict. Uh, or, there, as I said, there, the countries come to the conclusion that these uh, uh, lives of the innocent young people who might have been involved in the uh, building the future of their countries, uh, they're dying and um, it's just not worth it. The <laughs> physical, in the end, the physical size of the country doesn't determine the welfare and prosperity of its citizens. <laughs> and there are many, uh, pr you know, uh, proofs in um, Europe, um, etc. So that's my solution. Thank you, Leila. You remind me of what I wanted to sort of close with, which is the um, sort of the heart of this society. And I wanted to, as Azerbaijanis, how does how do you feel now that Turkey has made such overt support, the president and the defense minister voicing such strong uh, advocacy for the Azerbaijani side of this war? It, does it bring on memories of the war from a hundred years ago when Turkey was so instrumental in helping build democracy in Baku? Uh, Joanna, um, in one of my Facebook posts, I said that uh, the situation in the region remains a uh, situation before the First World War. Uh, you remember there was a scandal with uh, Serbia supplying weapons to, selling weapons to Armenia. I even said that uh, all elements existed. Serbia was absent, and now we have Serbia because you know that the First World War started uh, on the uh, assassination on the um, crown prince of uh, Austro-Hungary Hungary by the Serbian, uh, by, by the Bosnian Serb, uh, and um, now uh, we have uh, uh, Turkey, Russia, France, <laughs> Greece. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, generally, the risks of uh, more involvement of other countries is quite high. Uh, uh, we see uh, Iran uh, feels uncomfortable. Uh, we, uh, we have seen some uh, weapon supplies coming from uh, Muslim Iran to uh, Christian Armenia, <laughs> when they say about Christian-Muslim uh, confrontation. Uh, 
uh, so uh, I believe that uh, there are all elements of the uh, of that that this small uh, uh, you know war between Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, may turn to wider regional war. Armenia threatened to use uh, Iskander weapons today the, for, for the first time. Iskander weapons are, uh, you know, long range, uh, uh, you know, more serious kind of weapons, which can uh, uh, really uh, make a lot of damage to anything, to infrastructure. They can target uh, uh, important infrastructure. So, so that if, they, if it is used, then uh, it might be much more serious uh, issue. We know that there are two military, Russian military bases in Gumri, in the border with Turkey, and there is uh, an aviation base uh, uh, near to Yerevan, a uh, Russian aviation base near to Yerevan. Uh, I would also come to what Leila said about uh, societies, both in Azerbaijan and Armenia. At this stage, uh, hatred is so high that even writing innocent note, for example, today I wrote the note that saying that uh, poor, par poor parents don't like their children less than wealthy ones, hinting that only poor children of poor families fight. Uh, I was uh, uh, quite attacked by many people. It's not time to make division. We have to only talk about war, 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 so that uh, societies in both sides are electoralized. Any any positive signal, even by popular people in the social media, saying that uh, we have to think about soldiers dying or mothers crying is not popular. Even even saying that, oh, how bad that we lost so many young people. Uh, you are immediately attacked, saying that, oh, you you are why you'd say this? You want to distract? We have to focus only on the victory. We have to take our territories. It's understandable, but uh, but I can understand that even those who really want to in both in both countries uh, to build some kind of the uh, tiny bridges are failed because societies are now in the war mood very much in the war mood. Probably for that reason, I believe that the uh, politicians and silent dip diplomacy should work. But again, uh, Armenia should understand that without liberation of occupied territories, but serious, not just talks for talks, means group, no, now, or immediately uh, taking some kind of engagement that they will start liberating occupied territories from now. Probably under this condition, uh, uh, Azerbaijan can agree on some kind of the uh, talks. But again, uh, unfortunately, as I said, that uh, elections are in the United States are uh, probably, uh, this is also probably one of the reasons uh, why it started now, because uh, US is now busy with the elections. Could be, could be also one of the uh, think that U.S. will not be able at this stage to uh, to intervene and start trying to do something about it. U.S. is very distracted at this time and yeah. very myopic in only thinking about one topic. Um, isn't really paying enough attention to the rest of the world and the wars that are going on. And that's that's pretty obvious from what you see in the news here. However, I can say that this war was in my local newspaper today on page three. Uh, very in the Seattle Times had a large story uh, from the New York Times that talked about what's happening and sort of a, a illuminated about why this conflict is happening at this time. So I hope you're wrong and that the hate will somehow simmer down um, between the two societies, Arif, but thank you for what you had to say there. And Layla, I'll let you finish with um, a little bit about what it feels like to the average Azerbaijani to, to hear Turkey be so, um, so much of a strong supporter of Azerbaijan. Um, as you said, it, they haven't in the past. 
they're coming out very strongly in support of Azerbaijan. And and uh, the average person in Azerbaijan, are they feeling the love from Turkey in this situation? Uh, yeah, I think back home, um, and particularly recently, uh, many political parties celebrated a position, celebrated the 102nd or 103rd, 102nd year of liberation of Azerbaijan from uh, Bolsheviks in 1918. And uh, um, it was quite uh, well celebrated. So there are indeed, you're right the parallels with the past so the people um, keep the memory of the role which Turkey played in at least in 1918 um, liberating and uh, thanks to whom the uh, established of the independent Azerbaijani modern nation state was possible. Um, I think, yeah, and I also remember when the Turkish uh, jets appeared in a parade um, among the uh, bay, uh, on, above the bay um, in Baku Boulevard uh, some time ago when I was in Baku, and I will never forget that um, feelings of the crowd that they are not alone. That they're they have someone to behind. In general, it's of course quite sad because the mm -hmm. plans were totally different. Plans were different. Plans were that three uh, Caucasus states they get independent, they integrate in European Union, they integrate in NATO, and they become like the other European states, um, you know, uh, just members of the civilized community. Unfortunately, we're seeing the polarization. A greater division and polarization in the uh, region. Uh, so our dreams of having common Caucasus house unfortunately broke, at, uh, at least at the moment. But I believe that uh, eventually uh, the war, as I said, it's not a positive event. So uh, the people come from the war changed. And um, uh, as I said, the, um, the event, Azerbaijan was treated not fairly and was um, its role in the region and in the whole Middle East was um, underestimated. And unfortunately, the Western states saw Azerbaijan as a source of uh, natural resources. And if you go back, as you mentioned, 100 years ago, um, that also teaches us that Azerbaijan, if democracy supported in this country, not the oil resources, but the democracy supported there, it has enormous influence on the whole Middle East. And the uh, journal Molana Nasreddin was read and had enormous influence, starting with uh, Iran, uh, through Afghanistan, India, Iraq. All the Middle East was influenced, including Turkey itself. So we, uh, I hope those days will come back when Azerbaijan will be entrusted with that role of the, um, you know, source of liberating influences in the whole Middle East. And then Thank I think, um, yeah. Thank you, Leila. That's a wonderful place to end for us. Um, this morning, this evening. Um, I want to thank uh, the guests that I had here today, Arif Shakmarli, former Azerbaijani ambassador to the Council of Europe and the EU, and Dr. Leila Aliyev, Russian and East European Studies affiliate, Oxford School of Global and Area Studies at the University of Oxford in the UK. Um, war is happening, blood is being shed, Kill children are being killed, I can only hope for a quick solution, and I hope that peace is negotiated and soon found in Azerbaijan and the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Thank you. Thank you too. Thanks.